Well, welcome and thank you for joining the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, or IFAS, in this discussion series on democratic resilience in Europe. IFAS is a non-profit, non-governmental organization that supports electoral processes very broadly defined across the world. We've supported elections in European countries since the fall of the Iron Curtain. This is the 20th installment in our series. So far, we're focused on issues from electoral administration, cybersecurity, disinformation targeting, targeting women in politics, abuse of state resources, and the role of the Russian government in European elections. If you've missed any of our previous discussions, you can find recordings of them on our YouTube channel. My colleague is putting a chat to that in the link right now. So to celebrate our 20th installment, uh, we are organizing hybrid events since the pandemic also so allows with both panelists and audience online as well as here in the Boca Villa in Prague. I'm Magnus Oman, I'm the IFAS Senior Political Finance Advisor and also Director of the IFAS Regional Europe Office in the Czech Republic. We are hosting this discussion. This event is part of a <clears throat> larger USAID-funded program of democracy assistance, with the goal of supporting leadership that champions democratic practices and is made possible with the generous support of the American people. The resilience of democratic institutions and processes is essential for modern European democracies, especially in light of security risks and Kremlin disinformation strategies that seek to undermine our uh, core values. With new types of hybrid warfare, strengthening cybersecurity, tracking illicit financial flows, and commenting disinformation have become key components of critical national infrastructure. So today we will discuss if the Czech Republic, if Visegrad four countries and the broader region is ready to face the current and future challenges by the Kremlin to our democratic systems. And to better understand these issues, we have with us both here in Prague as well as online, uh, prominent experts on political and electoral processes in the region. So with us uh, here, we have Veronika Vichova, uh, Deputy Director of Analysis and Head of the Kremlin Watch Program of the European Value Center Security Policy, and Kristina Bage, uh, an, an analyst on Russian disinformation at Semantic Vision, also based here in the Czech Republic. Our online panelists are Matt Bailey, who is Senior Cyber and Information Integrity Advisor at IFAS, Rashu Kuchel, uh, Executive Director at Memo 98, and Kevin Sheaves, Associate Director at the International Forum for Democratic Studies at the National Endowment for Democracy. Matt and Kevin are with us uh, from the US. Uh, Rashu is normally based in Bratislava, but is today talking to us from Riga. And then we'll open for questions and comments. If our online audience have questions or comments, you can already now type those in using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So let me start by asking a question to Kevin. Um, and starting at a general view, what would you say are the main disinformation threats from Kremlin that we in Europe are facing today? Thanks for having me here um, and apologies for not being in there in person. I actually was in Prague this past week, but unfortunately had to come back here for some other business. So sorry for not seeing you all in person. Um, I think there's some things that are that are that are known um, these days about uh, Russia's propaganda efforts. They've been going on for really a decade or more at this point. The use of bots, the use of human trolls, the use of fake news websites, um, targeting really a variety of Western institutions, but also Eastern European institutions, of course. Um, and it's created quite a lot of uh, polarization. Uh, it, it's sort of used its propaganda to exploit or to make bigger some of these fissures in our democratic societies that are open. I think what is what is less known, and I think what might be changing now as a result of Russia's invasion is the use of elite capture mechanisms. And what I mean by that essentially is ways in which um, Russia and its interests, whether that's simply money through you know, membership of a board on, of uh, Rosneft or some other oil and gas entity or support for a political party or anything like that, these sort of mechanisms help amplify Russian propaganda that could be 
overt from places like Russia today or covert from some of these bots and trolls and inauthentic accounts that are out there in our online space. But they're amplified by domestic politicians, uh, many of which your average European or American or whoever else in the world trust um, and know and seems familiar. And when that information is shared by a local voice or a national voice instead of a foreign voice from Russia today or elsewhere, it sometimes has a lot more resonant, resonance. Hopefully that's changing as of sort of a um, real amount of shame, I would say, of being involved in some of these Russian state-owned entities these days since February 24th. Uh, but this is a new trend, one I think is, is even more uh, concerning than ones that are, that are more well-known. Thank you very much, Kevin. And I want to ask the same question in a sense to Matt, uh, what are the main threats we see from Kremlin? But in this case, in, from the perspective of cyber threats, yeah, thanks, Magnus. And Kevin, I appreciated the way that you framed that up. Actually, the two of you have both framed this in terms of um, what uh, US CISA has described as broad spectrum cyber espionage. So you have on the one hand, our traditional categories of influence operations or propaganda and disinformation on the other cybersecurity attacks. We think about uh, distributed denial of service attacks or hacking of servers or critical infrastructure. And just to set the stage, you know, this won't come as a surprise to many on the panel, certainly, and in the audience. Um, these two spheres really uh, overlap with one another and are part of a cohesive strategy that spans not only sort of the, the theater of war in Ukraine, but continent and even uh, worldwide. So, you know, just in terms of what we've seen since February 24th, we're seeing deployment of uh, malware attacks against government and uh, uh, non-governmental infrastructure and organizations, both within Ukraine and uh, neighboring countries. Uh, a lot of that, I think also to Kevin's point, is like there's the stuff that we know about or that's publicly reported, and there's a whole rest of the iceberg below the surface of the water that we don't know about yet or we may not know about uh, ever. So we're seeing um, the, the deployment of kind of, I would break it into two categories flashy public shows of force through cybersecurity attacks. This would include, for example, the ongoing denial of service attacks against Lithuanian assets, um, you know, nominally in nominally by uh, hacker groups, but presumably with affiliation with the Kremlin and, and coordination. And uh, essentially as like a diplomatic countermeasure, uh, a way of showing ire with uh, some of Lithuania's alignments um, with regards to Ukraine. But we're also seeing broad spectrum attacks against um, infrastructure within Ukraine, the deployment of MC catchers, essentially like surveillance, uh, cell phone network towers and other hardware. We're seeing uh, the use of this surveillance infrastructure to actually target and micro target disinformation. So the answer to your question, which I'll go deeper on as we continue through the panel is we're seeing the whole grab bag of tricks being thrown um, at, uh, at the continent right now and at anybody who's sort of engaging with Russian interests with regards to Ukraine or otherwise. And this is stuff that is at an extreme moment because of the war and because of the dip diplomatic crisis, but is, has really been building over the last couple of decades through uh, the Kremlin's capabilities and playbook. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, let's bring this to the level of the Czech Republic then. Uh, Veronica, first of all, what do you see as the main threats from the Russian government that the Czech Republic is facing today? Of course. Uh, and first of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Well, I would say that besides the most obvious threat coming from the conventional Russian invasion of Ukraine, and let's not be mistaken, Ukrainians right now are fighting also for our security and for our sovereignty, not just for their own. Uh, when I look at the more soft ways how Russia can influence other countries, I would say briefly that uh, in the Czech Republic, I would say the threat is divided into three main categories, uh, which we see most important first is in the information sphere. So in the Czech Republic, there are dozens of channels, be it websites, uh, Facebook uh, pages, fake Facebook groups, chain emails, which spread pro Kremlin disinformation either via uh, directly sponsored by the Kremlin or by proxy from ideological reasons or personal reasons. Uh, there is also strong economic influence still, be it in the area of uh, money laundering and um, uh, still not exposed activities and criminal activities. 
or even our energy uh, energy dependency on Russia, which is currently very strongly limiting our policy options and how we can deter Russia from uh, future uh, conventional threats. And then last but not least, I would say there are still prevalent political influence threats. There are still pretty high level politicians representing the Czech Republic, which uh, translate or repeat Russian propaganda and disinformation and serve uh, Kremlin's interests, either here in the Czech Republic or on the European level. Thank you very much. Christina, do you, do you agree? Do you want anything yes. you want to add? Yes, hi, and thank you for having me. And I definitely uh, support uh, Veronica's comment. And I think there are, uh, yeah, there are, of course, uh, a lot of more threats, but I would also stress that uh, since the presidential elections coming up at the beginning next year, there is a, there is a threat of uh, influence or, or inter interference with our democratic process as an uh, election. And uh, of course, uh, we already mentioned the war in Ukraine. So one of the main threats is to that Kremlin will try to undermine our political and uh, political support and also support of our civil society towards Ukraine. Thank you very much. And, and Rastio, if you listen to what uh, Matt and Kevin have been saying, and especially what Christina and Veronica have been saying, how does this relate from your perspective to, to Slovakia, to Visegrad 4 region, and indeed to the larger region? Well, thank you very much uh, uh, for the invitation and, and uh, greetings from, from Riga. Now it very much resonates, I think. Uh, you know, we we have uh, some some data uh, to to prove that uh, Slovakia is really very vulnerable uh, to all these influences, and and I would just say that uh, perhaps uh, trying to 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 answer your question about uh, the biggest threat, uh, I think this is really um, you know the, uh, the the ability of Russia to undermine uh, the the unprecedented unity uh, that we are currently experiencing and, and and I think this is what we have really seen uh, coming from uh, from 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 the Russian state media uh, you know when when I look at uh, what they report I think they they really try to highlight uh, what they would term a growing discontent among US and European citizens with the supply of western weapons to Ukraine uh, they are basically talking about the uh, the, the increasing prices uh, they are talking about the fatigue uh, from Ukrainian refugees. So these are basically all the topics uh, that they pursue and, and that they basically try to sow division. So I think the, the crucial thing, and but I know that I, we will be discussing uh, this perhaps in, in, in the second part of this webinar, but I think the, the most important I, I want to stress already is really to remain united. I mean, to remain in the support and, and, and not to actually let uh, these type of narratives uh, to divide, uh, you know, the, the, the various uh, countries. Thank you very much, Rasho. And Kevin, getting back to you, we're talking about disinformation in this context, but um, how does disinformation impact different areas of our societies, including areas that we may not immediately think of? I think, as I mentioned earlier, some of the things that are more well known is what's happening in the online space. And I think that's partly because it's a little bit easier to see and measure um, because we have really great data analysis techniques that are used by civil society organizations put out occasionally, and I think increasingly so by some of the major platforms. So we can see this information a little bit better, a little bit more clearly. I think some of the things that we can't see is two, uh, two things, I would say. One is what's happening in traditional TV and, and, and radio. Um, these are things that we sometimes forget because there's so much focus on what's happening on Facebook or Twitter or some of the bigger platforms out there. But this is something that a huge, sec huge sectors of society, especially those that trend older, um, but those some of their, their thinking on Russia. Um, and uh, again, in places where there's less independent media, nationally, there's less support for it local, where there's, there's worries about trust and credibility of certain enterprises, um, and places where the state, the Russian state, can really augment that through through money, through access, Russia Today, and all the rest of these things, um, it can outmatch and outcompete some of these media enterprises, and at least be an alternative voice out there 
these trends are probably much more acute, I would say, and elsewhere outside of Europe, but it's still true in Europe. The second one is what's happening offline. And I think this is extraordinarily hard to measure. Conversations that are happening about Russia and Ukraine um, uh, because of longstanding you know, cultural ties or whatever, but conversations that are happening in places like um, you know, a church or a labor group um, or you know, even schools and education that are sort of you know, not really emphasizing some of these histories of authoritarianism and, and what's happened recently or what happened to the Soviet Union. Things like that are every day and their, their impact can be much harder to measure because people don't engage back on that same platform. You can't do as much sort of real-time analysis the way you can online. But these are really important areas that I think civil society and, and even governments need to begin thinking about in a lot more holistic and intentional way. Um, thank you, Kevin. And Christina, I want to follow up in again in the Czech context. So how do the things that Kevin was talking about relate to our country? And what are the main disinformation threats that you see in the Czech Republic today? Um, disinformation threats. Oh, uh, yeah, we are. I already mentioned the war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So it's now since the, since the February topic number one, and we are actually experiencing the huge the hugest uh, disinformation campaign and war we have we have ever had uh, in the Czech Republic. And uh, yeah, so Ukraine is a general topic uh, number one, and there are several particular narratives which are really spread uh, in the Czech the disinformation scene. The first group uh, originates uh, in Russia, and uh, they are mainly related to uh, Ukraine being Nazi state and how Bucha massacre was orchestrated and so on and so forth. So these kind of disinformation we can track back to, to Kremlin, uh, mm -hmm. Kremlin government outlets or uh, just the Kremlin's person. The second group of disinformation narratives, uh, they are uh, checkmate, I would say. And uh, right now they are exploiting a uh, bad economic situation, which uh, will come up uh, upcoming weeks, upcoming month. And uh, uh, this, uh, this group of narratives uh, blames uh, the Ukraine migrants and refugees who are coming uh, here are based in the Czech Republic right now. So they are actually the reason why we have so poor mm -hmm. and bad economic situation. And the third, topic is the most, I would say, favorite and beloved within the Czech disinformation scene, and this is the migrants, which are actually on our on our radar every every election and almost every year. Let me follow up on that, because I think as Horacio mentioned, Ukraine fatigue. So is there, um, what does that mean? The war is not going off quite some time. A lot of people have left Ukraine, quite a few are in the Czech Republic. Um, does that impact the effectiveness of disinformation narratives as people are getting, seeing that this is not being resolved anytime soon? I would say that, uh, yeah, at the beginning, there was such a huge support for Ukraine mm -hmm. coming from government and the civil society. And uh, there were actually several public surveys which show that the support for Ukraine and and the hate against the Russia is at the maximum we have ever had. And as you mentioned, the war is going for almost four months. And you can see that some of the public voices are kind of, okay, we done enough and now it's time to be focused on our issue, but uh, on our issues like the Czech Republic. But I would not say that, uh, yeah, I would not say that the this, that the disinformation or the disinformation campaigns and narratives are more effective. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Um, following up, Rashtu, I wanted to ask you a question. There was we've read in the news a very interesting case in Slovakia quite recently uh, of direct uh, influence by the Czech uh, by the Russian government. And this then even uh, came to involve this Slovak authorities. Could you tell us a little bit about that case? Sure, but uh, if I may, I really want to highlight what, what Kevin said before, because I think this is very important. Uh, and I completely agree with him that sometimes uh, perhaps we are uh, overexcited with uh, what, we, what we see on social media. But, but definitely in Russia, it remains uh, to be television 
where people get the news. And, and, and I think this is uh, one of the reasons why actually we are monitoring uh, the main Russian uh, TV channels as, 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 as I speak. Uh, I will just share uh, in the chat uh, uh, a link to our newsletter uh, that uh, you can subscribe to and, and, and uh, you can actually see what is the result of this monitoring. Um, and, and I think uh, it, it, is, it is really uh, perhaps uh, important to mention that um, we have seen a, a shift in, in, in the reporting of Russian media. Uh, and, and this shift is basically, uh, I think it's, it's clear that for, for a long time, uh, you know, the Russian media reported, you know, that the West is, uh, so is, is trying to undermine Russia and, 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 and is trying to sort of uh, attack Rus Russia. Uh, uh, but uh, but uh, I think more recently with, with the war, uh, you know, the, 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 the sort of, uh, I mean, the propaganda previously was basically uh, trying to support passivity. Uh, you know, casting doubt on reality, you know, discouraging political participation. But now I think we see a real shift where I think the propaganda is trying to mobilize uh, popular support for Putin's war. Um, if I still have time to, to briefly mention the case you mentioned, I think it's, it's also very important because for years we have uh, had suspicion, you know, that, uh, that uh, there are some very concrete operations uh, run by, uh, you know, the, the Russian spies uh, in the Czech Republic, in Slovakia, in, in the wider region. Uh, but I think this case was actually, I think, first uh, smoking gun evidence, you know, that, uh, that uh, it was actually disclosed on, on a video uh, where a, a sort of representative from the Russian embassy was actually giving money uh, to, to a person who was uh, basically also a contributor to one of these disinformation websites. Uh, so I think that is what, uh, what made it sort of, uh, I mean, very important that, that we had that proof uh, finally and caught on camera. Thank you very much, Rastu. And it is an excellent newsletter. Uh, if anyone is watching the video of this discussion, we will make sure to put a link to the newsletter also in the information below the YouTube video. Um, Veronica, we, we, we haven't had very clear cases in the Czech Republic that I'm aware of, of direct Rus uh, Russian government influence of the type of case that, that Rastu was talking about in Slovakia. Or have we? I mean, is it something I, we, I've missed? Or if not, do we expect that there may be cases that we just don't know? Well, there might not be a video of a disinformer taking money from somebody from the Russian embassy, for sure, uh, for now, at least. <laughs> Uh, however, let's not forget that last year it was revealed that the Russian military intelligence actually participated in an explosion on the Czech territory, during which two people, two Czech citizens died. Uh, it's not the same thing, it's not from the same area, but I think it really showed. And also it was sort of a wake up call for even the Czech government that ties to Russia can be very endangering to our sovereignty. Well, when it comes to people running disinformation channels in the Czech Republic, they might have various reasons to do so. It might not be just direct connections to the Kremlin or financial reasons, uh, or it, it might be financial reasons, but because they get money from advertising. So we don't necessarily know yet. And I don't think there has been that much investigation done into this. So we still might be surprised in the future. I would also point out that what we sometimes forget and shouldn't is that even uh, even people around uh, our Czech president, uh, people in his office, are directly lobbying for Russian interests in Czech politics and economy, including very hardly lobbying together with some of the, at that time, ministers of the Czech government for Rosatom getting, uh, the, uh, getting to finish the Czech nuclear plant Dukovane without public or properly transparent tender. So again, I think there are still pretty clear cases and we might still be a little bit surprised how far these routes actually go. And you mentioned the, the president and there will be an election next uh, January. Any speculation of where, what may happen in terms of Russian influence in relation to those elections? 
I think it's too soon to tell, but also because we still don't know all the candidates. Uh, I think what is uh, going to be interesting is to see financial flows during the election campaigns or pre-election campaigns. Uh, and it's uh, it's also going to be interesting to see who the main horse is going to be that they will bet on, because there are a couple of candidates <laughs> they might choose based on the at the time preferences. So I would not to skip ahead. Uh, I think we will see. But I would also like to say that I think we have also very strong, several strong democratic candidates. So I do hope that it's going to be a fair fight. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, I think you wanted to come in here. If I could pick up on one thing that Veronica mentioned in tie to the earlier discussion about maintaining solidarity and support for Ukraine. Uh, recently, we asked about four or five experts uh, from Eastern Europe and the Ukraine of how they can maintain democratic solidarity globally and support for them, right? And they had a couple of interesting answers. You know, the, the most interesting answer I found was from a Ukrainian scholar who wrote with us and said that uh, a key argument is focusing on this issue of sovereignty and that I uh, the invasion of Ukraine is, is really synonymous with just a complete and utter violation of sovereignty and hearkening back to these ideas of sort of neo-colonialism um, and liberation movements and so forth. I mean, it's obvious that this is a battle between a democracy and autocracy. It's now obvious it's a battle between a corrupt system and one that's you know beginning to rid itself of corruption. Um, but sometimes we forget the sort of broader standpoint of really focusing on, well, this is a war that was a complete and violation of Ukraine's sovereignty. And that point is something that bridges the divides between some of the populists out there that are rising in popularity and in national prominence, both in Europe, America, and elsewhere. They're, they're nationalists. They're so, a lot of them are really focused on this issue of sovereignty. And that is something that can beat back some of these local voices that whether or not they've been sort of co-opted or have engaged with the Russian propaganda information, they still amplify it um, and sort of are skeptical of these issues of democracy and everything. But this idea of really kind of focusing on sovereignty as a way to maintain democratic so solidarity can be really important. I mean, Russia's out there poisoning opposition members and foreign soil doing all these things that Veronica just walked through. I mean, these are all blatant violations of sovereignty that aren't even just limited to, to warfare in Ukraine. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, my next question goes to Matt. We've been talking about the war in Ukraine. Uh, naturally, that is a key factor in, in the discussions we're having. Um, the war in Ukraine has also been described as hybrid warfare in terms of combining traditional uh, military warfare with, with cyber warfare. What would you say are the main forms of attacks we've seen and what can we expect in the future? Yeah, well, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, in my, my previous remarks, you know, part of the difficulty in assessing what's happening here is just the availability of data or, or forensics to understand what attacks are taking place. But part of it is that all of these different techniques are interrelated with one another in very sophisticated ways. The, the fundamental thing that I'd like to leave everybody with is you can think of this question of surveillance or data collection as almost upstream from a lot of then the tactics and strategies that are being deployed in the uh, in the sort of cyber targeted cyber attack or information operations spaces. So I mentioned very briefly um, the you know the well documented deployment of what are called MC catchers by um, forces on the ground in Ukraine. These have been used for um, more and less justifiable purposes by law enforcement military uh, organizations around the world for quite some time, but they're essentially false cell phone towers that intercept data from your device by telling it that they're a real one that belongs to the telecom or the internet service provider. Uh, and then they can do a, a wide variety of things with that. They can uh, potentially track where your phone moves as you they triangulate between towers as you move through your day. They can intercept or even manipulate the content of websites that are coming to and from your device. There's essentially uh, at the, the far end of the of these attacks can be sort of total access to data that's flowing to and from your device, as well as the ability to correlate it to you as an individual under the right circumstances. The point that I'm, I'm leading to here is that, you know, these towers can be dismantled as Ukraine is, is retaking its territory, they can be pulled down, but they're a really good sort of icon for how these hybrid uh, digital warfare operations take place. They're about collecting as much information about what's happening on the ground as possible and then targeting attacks, whether that's propaganda, 
whether that's spyware we've seen with the NSO Pegasus, um, Pegasus spyware or similar offerings from a wide variety of other commercial vendors. Um, and so that's really the where these things are going next. And that's also interoperable with uh, targeting of real world attacks, including the um, you know targeting of ballistic missiles or uh, troop movements or localized influence operations like we've just been discussing. So um, one thing I just wanted to touch on extremely quickly just to round that point out is that as the, the infrastructure, the identity and surveillance infrastructure of the internet and cell phone networks, et cetera, are, is getting more and more robust everywhere in the world without any regard to the Kremlin or its strategies just globally, the ability to micro-target these attacks, whether that's against marginalized communities, activist groups, solidarity networks, uh, opposition parties and political members, women in public life, or against journalists, again, as we've seen with spyware, um, is increasing. And so the future of, and what we're seeing play out today across Europe and across the world with Russian influence operations is all about it's sort of the macro scale influence in terms of trying to uh, create polarization, create loss of trust in democratic institutions, but it's also an increasing ability to reach to specific individuals, specific and in particular marginalized or underserved or disenfranchised groups with messages or attacks that either chill, uh, can cause direct physical harm or can cause disenfranchisement for, or disillusionment with democracy itself. So that's what really what's playing out, um, both within Ukraine itself, within the theater of war, and also uh, across Europe and around the world. Thank you very much, Matt. We've talked a lot about challenges and problems so far, and I want to turn to solutions. Um, I, I will ask all our panelists the same question, which is basically, what do you see as the key parts, key activities in countering malign Kremlin influence? Um, and to what extent do these solutions need to be applied differently in each country? Uh, Kevin, I'm going to start with you. What, what should we do? I have many thoughts on this. Um, I'll go in depth, really, I think, on one. I think that's, that's really interesting and maybe unique to, to this region. Um, and, you know, of, of these many ideas, and I think, you know, um, our office does a lot of publishing on this and talking about some of the best and most innovative civil society responses to threats to the information space, talk about things like data access from platforms, from governments, from major research organizations. We talk about the need to be better trained and better skilled for civil society organizations to be up to speed on some of the latest technical techniques to counter this disinformation. Uh, we've talked a lot about being having a networked approach, being able to learn together, being able to adapt together because things that are happening in the Czech Republic may have already been seen elsewhere, and not just in Eastern Europe, uh, but other regions too. There's a lot we can learn from places like Africa um, and Asia um, that are dealing with this. But one big thing I would say that I think has been really innovative and, and interesting in the Eastern and Central European context is the use of decentralized citizen response efforts. These are things like the, the elves that are out there countering disinformation each day. Um, and it's really an amazing way to scale a response um, because no matter the region, and this is true in places that have a stronger civil society background like Eastern Europe and Western Europe, but also places that are really outmatched in terms of just the numbers of people working on this um, in, in elsewhere in the world. Um, but, you know, in places like the Baltics and the Czech Republic, and, and this model has gone elsewhere, um, you have thousands and thousands of people responding, you know, maybe not quite as as, as perfect or as um, you know, doing it all day long the way that a lot of uh, civil society counter disinformation organizations and fact checkers do. Uh, but being able to scale the solution is extremely important in, in this regard. This was one thing we gathered people in Prague just last week to talk about this issue. And one of the person, one of the analysts who looked at um, how well Ukraine has been able to respond in the information space, not just in the last four months, but well before, uh, since 2014, was because the size of their civil society was really apparent. There's a lot of people working on this, a lot of people concerned about it. And being able to scale solutions like this is really important. There's a way that we can lean into this organization, support these decentralized efforts, even if they're not perfect, even if you can't sort of control their efforts or control the direction of, of where it's going. I think these type of um, systems need to really be leaned into more. Um, thank you very much, Kevin. Christina, same question to you. What, what should we do? 
Yes, and I will stick to informational environment and the Czech Republic. And uh, I would like to highlight uh, one of the homework we have to, which needs to be done within the Czech Republic. And I would say it's more uh, intensive government, more intensive gov government involvement. And I will elaborate on that. And particularly, it's a missing strategic communication. I think Veronica will be my backup on that because they done a lot of uh, a lot of job on that on that topic. So there is completely missing strategic uh, communication, mm -hmm. despite we experienced three years of COVID, which was a total disaster. I know there were different government, but uh, now we have war, and will we still don't see any progress in the uh, in that case. Uh, right now, in the Czech Republic, we have a really capable civil society full of experts, as Veronica and the others, who are willing to help and offer their expertise. We have a private sector which offers data, technical solutions, software, and is also willing and able to help. And we have a government who needs to have in its government guidelines. They need to be advised. It it needs to okay. They actually, I, my perception and my opinion is that the government does not know what to do. Mm -hmm. So they have two components, private sector, civil society, and the government needs to listen and act, act upon that. So I think the key part of that is also the cooperation, willing to listen and collaborate. And also definitely the support for civil society, because uh, even I said that there is this really strong, uh, capable mm -hmm. and full of experts civil society it it still needs to have for some financial support and also the support for independent media and investigative journalism because it's really key to have a resistant uh, civil sector and public as well thank you uh, veronica do you agree anything you want to add uh i absolutely agree with uh, the strategic communication framework i think that our government declares that it is interested in fighting disinformation mm -hmm. and uh, setting up such a concept, but it, they are in a difficult position because all the previous governments have been ignoring this problem, basically. Uh, so we're really hoping that our propositions and our help will be accepted to some extent and that at least for future crises, we will have a framework in place that we'll, we'll be able to use. Besides TRACOM, what I would mention is what we really have to do in the short term is realize that the situation that we are in right now is going to get worse before it's going to get better and probably pretty soon with rising energy prices, food prices, uh, the Ukrainian refugees, the invasion, I mean, uh, maybe even COVID again. Uh, I think that uh, our government uh, is in front of a difficult task in the autumn, especially, and uh, they will have to have some plan in place. Uh, and I'm saying that also considering uh, what was said before about the message of sovereignty. I think that works really well. However, when there will be a lot of people in the Czech Republic who can't afford to drive to work or to buy dinner for their kids, I think the concept of sovereignty will get a little bit lower on their priority list. Uh, Last but not least, I would say I mentioned economic influence of Russian Federation and the Czech Republic. There are, again, some signs that the Czech government wants to do something about that. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs is preparing the Magnitsky legislation, which would enable us to target specific individuals or companies which are involved in strategic corruption or breaching human rights. That's a good step, but we still need more capacity to investigate and charge uh, people involved, involved in money laundering and corruption here in the Czech Republic. I think there is a lot of shady companies we still, still don't even know about because there is not a, enough transparent system for them to even declare uh, uh, ownership. And completely last thing I want to say, we really need to keep supporting Ukraine in the long term, despite all these problems, be it humanitarian help, being uh, providing them with weapons that they need as it was said before, to protect not only their country and territory, but also ours. Thank you very much. Um, Rastya, what do you see as the, our priorities in addressing this issue? No, I think it's, uh, I, I completely agree with uh, many of the things that uh, my, uh, you know, colleagues uh, said already. I think uh, in, in trying to sort of come back to the main question, uh, are we ready yet? I, I would say we are not ready yet. I think we are uh, we are in a better situation than before. Um, I think 
for me, uh, I would really start with a really proper scaling of Russia. I think this is something that uh, we still have difficulty to, 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 to really properly scale, uh, you know, where, where Russia is. And, and it has unfortunately uh, proven to be problematic in the past. And I still think that, uh, that we do repeat uh, some, of the, some of the mistakes uh, from the past. But nevertheless, I think we are in a, in a better uh, position uh, in overall. Uh, but still, um, I think uh, the disinformation is trying to enhance polarization. It's, it's trying to kill activism. So obviously, I think I would support civil participation. I think we need to rebuild the trust into democratic uh, institutions. I think this is super important, especially nowadays, especially you know, in, in this current uh, situation, that's really crucial. Obviously, uh, you know, building uh, media literacy, building digital media literacy, I think is, is another thing. I mean, Stratcom has already been mentioned. We need to protect uh, such institutions as elections, and we shouldn't really go down an easy road, which would be uh, that I heard recently, you know, introduction of uh, ICTs, um, you know, that, that, should help, that should help us uh, to, to, to sort of uh, limit the polarization, but well, it is exactly the opposite. Uh, unless you have uh, trust in the system, this is not going to help you. So I would, you know, I would look at it with, with caution, but, but certainly uh, I think, uh, again, uh, we are, uh, I think, better than we were before, but we are not there yet uh, to say that we are fully, fully prepared. Thank you, Rastio. Uh, Matt, over to you. What needs to be done? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think the, the point about strategic communications has been made by every person one by one amongst us, and I, I wanted to make it as well. At IFAS, we're clearly uh, engaged on this very actively, both in the framework of kind of proactive uh, measures like debunking or pre-bunking um, nascent disinformation campaigns. We've also been developing programming around crisis communications protocols, which are obviously very important. Um, and so broadly speaking, our work, um, we're very interested in kind of two time scales. One is what I would call uh, incident response. When something goes sideways and everybody's stressed out and there's a political crisis and a logistical crisis, humanitarian crisis perhaps, you need to have planned and built your organizational capacity as an election management body, as a digital ministry, as, as a government, well ahead of that moment so that you know what to do and how to respond. And so, you know, it's it's sort of hard to overstate the unmet need there in governments around the world, certainly across Europe. Um, and so working to build that out. So that's the short term. And then the longer term is really these other issues that we're starting to raise here. Um, making sure you have digital resilience so you understand that your, your uh, critical infrastructure, your energy infrastructure, your voting, uh, voter rolls, uh, et cetera, are not likely or are less likely to be subject to attacks or infiltration or sort of passive hacking that just sits there waiting to be activated when the geopolitical moment is right. Um, but it also means longer generational uh, investments in media literacy, in digital hygiene training for everyday citizens, and ensuring not only that there's robust civil society, but that journalists and civil society have the means to protect themselves um, from these types of tools. Um, there's one other sort of framework that I wanted to, to add to the conversation. In the world of cybersecurity, we often talk not just about resilience in the way that we talk about democratic resilience, but we talk about continuity of operations planning, meaning when there's a crisis, it could be a hurricane, it could be an invasion. How do you know that you're gonna be able to continue the core operations of your institution or your company or your democracy? One of the really inspiring things that we've seen that I think doesn't get enough um, coverage, at least in the press that I run into with regards to Ukraine, is that uh, the government corporations there have gotten really, really good at like restoring from catastrophic hacking or denial of service attacks. Uh, I saw one article that said, man, the Ukrainians are really good at restoring an entire network from backup. Um, it can be completely melted down to the wires and they'll be back up in 30 minutes. And that's because uh, there's been a lot of attention to that continuity of operations question. In the world of democracy, I think we are worried not just about ministry websites being back up, but looking towards the next round of elections and knowing that if you have a lot of internally displaced persons 
or folks who have suddenly gone from living domestically to being expats, that they'll have the ability to practically participate in the democratic processes of the country. And so uh, at IFAS, we're worried about kind of these three questions, the immediate incident response, strategic communications, time scale, this question of longer term democratic resilience, and then this question of how do you have resilience and crisis at the same time, given that we're likely to see more of this in the coming years, unfortunately. Well, thank you, Matt. And for the final round of questions, I want to again ask the um, same question to each panelist, but specifically what your organizations are doing uh, to address these issues and to countering malign influence by the Russian government. So, Veronica, let me start with you. What is the European Values Center doing in this area? Well, I could talk for hours. <laughs> Don't have hours. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I'll just mention one specific uh, project that uh, we are running since basically since the invasion, uh, which is in February. And that is something we call Information Defense Hub. Uh, so shortly after the invasion, we were thinking how we can help. Uh, there are organizations which provide humanitarian help or uh, they collect money for weapons. Uh, we wanted to also somehow contribute in our own way. And we have been focusing on information warfare and Russian influence for many years. Uh, so what we did is we started to invite Ukrainian experts on information warfare who couldn't continue to work inside Ukraine for obvious reasons and were coming to Europe. So we helped them relocate, we helped them find safe accommodation, find shelter, but we also built them safe uh, spaces, provided them with uh, safe uh, equipment for work. And they're currently working with us uh, in uh, our premises, our offices. Together with them, we're trying to provide insightful information about what is happening in Ukraine every week. Uh, they have a lot of contacts still there, so their information is usually very updated, insightful, analytical. Uh, you can read their outputs in a newsletter that goes out every two weeks. It's called the Ukraine Watch Briefing. It's on our website. You can subscribe to that. Uh, they're uh, wonderful women who really know their craft very well. And it was said here before that uh, Ukrainians have always been really good at covering this information, at least for the last couple of years. So we also try to sort of pick their brains a little bit and uh, use their knowledge, learn from them, and uh, help them get to the right people here, decision makers, policy makers, to talk about what actually they need and what needs to be done to help Ukrainians in the most efficient way. Thank you very much. Um, and turning to you, Kevin, what is the focus of the International Forum for Democratic Studies uh, encountering malign uh, criminal influence? It's a huge priority for us. And, you know, a, a really substantial amount of NED's investments and funding across the world go towards information space issues and go towards supporting independent media is probably the biggest um, uh, target for, our, for things that we fund and demand from the field. Um, but also some of the tracking and analyzing and countering disinformation. So fact-checking networks, but also some of these non-traditional things I mentioned earlier about looking at offline community groups and things like that that are more innovative. I think really one thing that, that we're pushing Ned and other funders in this field to do is to really lean into some of these innovative and entrepreneurial approaches to countering disinformation. We have in the research community, and this is where the International Forum does more because we're for the research arm of NET in the space, um, we have a little better sense of how effective fact checking is. And it's modestly effective across the board. It's not a silver bullet or it's not, it doesn't solve all the problems, but we really don't know the effect of a lot of other interventions in this space. There's very little data out there. Some of these things are actually very difficult to measure. The payoff sometimes comes way in the long term. It's not an immediate sort of feedback loop that you have with some programs and development out there. And so we're trying to really encourage a really highly entrepreneurial, you know, risk tolerant approach to funding um, things in the sphere. The last thing I'd mention is the importance, I mentioned this briefly earlier, of a networked approach, the ways in which the global community, the global community of counter disinformation responders can learn together. And this is where I think those in Central and Eastern Europe can actually be very much the teachers and of a lot of other places, including in Western Europe, maybe because of investments from NED and elsewhere, but some of the most innovative and successful and entrepreneurial approaches are coming from this region. I'm pretty persuaded by that. Not all of them, but some of the best. And there's a lot that this region could do to teach those in Western Europe who actually don't have as much focused network civil society responses because they're just not a part of some of this funding stream, perhaps. Maybe that's more polar.
from Sweden. I completely agree about the vulnerability of Western and Northern Europe for many of these issues. We don't have any of these networks in place that you're talking about, and I'm really concerned how resilient these societies are likely to be. Um, Christina, what about sem semantic vision? What are you doing? So I should first out that the semantic vision is a private company which runs a military grade open uh, information system. Uh, the system actually enables us to uh, collect and analyze 90% 90, 90 of uh, URL based internet content. And thanks to that, we have uh, early warning disinformation mechanism. So what we are doing, we identify the new disinformation campaigns and narratives in the early stages. It's like short term, short term activity. In a more long term, uh, because of the data, we are able to compare different uh, disinformation campaigns and uh, do the comparison, try to find new channels, a new way, and new topics, which uh, Kremlin uh, exploits and uses. And uh, we, are not, uh, we are not operating just in a Czech language. Uh, we have our ex expertise, knowledge, and a system in uh, different languages, just English, Russian, Chinese, and so on and so forth. So. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Rastya, what about Memo 98? I mean, from the very beginning, we really, um, I mean, tried very hard to see what could be uh, our contribution. I mean, we have uh, we have been working, uh, focusing on Russia. I mean, since 2003, 2004, you know, when we basically monitored uh, primarily traditional media in the context of elections, and 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 so we have developed. Uh, a, a really big network of uh, of organizations and and also uh, individual analysts that we have trained over these last two decades. Uh, I mean, primarily focusing on traditional media, and then as of 2016, basically trying to look also at uh, at social media. Um, and so we initially, I mean, when when the war started, I mean, yes, same as Veronica, we tried to help. Uh, our, um, our Ukrainian analysts are the best, uh, really, in, in our group. Uh, so obviously, we we were trying to help them. And then we had this idea that uh, we, we should really uh, use uh, use them and, and, and try to monitor, you know, what is basically happening in the Russian state media. Um, and so that is what, uh, what we came up with this idea with, with the newsletter that uh, would not fact check because uh, at this stage I think uh, you know and, and I should have mentioned that this newsletter currently it is it is distributed in English but but it's it's already translated and we are planning to actually uh, distribute it um, uh, through social media through Telegram through YouTube also uh, to the Russian speaking communities and uh, currently we are a little bit um, uh, sort of skeptical that someone from Russia would be actually interested to read uh, the, the, the full fact check of what is basically told uh, on, on Russian state media. But, but instead, we came up with an idea that uh, we will present what the Russian state media say, and then we would also offer to the reader an ability to, to compare what the independent media say. And then we have many other sort of sections. Uh, so after reading the newsletter, you, you can get a sense I think of the main differences in the narratives, it could also give you some idea what are the, the narratives of the week. And so that's primarily what we have at the moment. I mean, we, we will continue this and, and we are working with, with other organizations and, and we will try to see how we can sort of reach out also uh, to, 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 to the Russians, because I think that's uh, another thing which is very important. Um, I think there is uh, obviously um, a silent uh, minority, uh, or, or, or possibly even even majority, uh, that is basically uh, afraid. Uh, but I think uh, there are people who are trying to to seek uh, to to learn more information, and and that could be one of the ways uh, for them to to actually get that information. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Matt, but first, Kevin, you wanted to add something. 10 seconds to amplify Rusto's point. Um, I come actually from a background on China and having seen this story before of a society that was open at one point 
you know, a lot of activists and things like that working on a topic, and then suddenly it's become much more closed, much more authoritarian, even not just so the idea of the silent majority, I think it's exactly right, or silent minority, it's exactly right. But also there's just going to be a lack of knowledge at some point in the future about Russia, because it's at some point it might, I, my hope is not, there's a lot of efforts from that and elsewhere to people to, to continue to find ways to open up Russia. But at some point, Russia might become a very close society and you need people who actually understand this country so you can continue to work on it and deal with it in the democracy space and elsewhere. That's a huge problem in the China community now because so few people can get into China and work on China. Um, and there's a whole range of issues related to that. But I think Rostov's point is really important to, to continue to leverage the use of, leverage these Russian exiles who are now elsewhere or finding other ways to work on this topic. Thank you, Kevin, for also bringing in the, the China perspective. Um, so, Matt, finally, what is IFAS doing to counter malign foreign influence? Yeah, well, and also I, I appreciated, Kevin, somewhere in there, I think you brought up the tragedy that's unfolding for the Russian people themselves. And I just wanted to take a moment and recognize that because we haven't haven't done it so um, so much as we should in this, this conversation. So I guess my, my two final thoughts, I've highlighted a little bit of what we're doing in terms of trainings and trying to build overall capacity but two further um, frames for our work. One is building novel modes of transnational or regional coordination amongst these key ministries, key civil society groups. So one thing we're, we're very excited, to, we're just getting ready to pilot is uh, international uh, networks for coordination amongst election management bodies, specifically when I, with an eye towards things like cybersecurity threat intelligence and bringing key industry players to the table. So you know, making sure that these organizations that have sometimes been underfunded, sometimes have had a, essentially a, a non-digital mandate or view their mission in that way, to rapidly expand their capacity to understand what's happening in this suddenly transnationally uh, influenced mission that they have. Uh, so really, really needing to accelerate those, those capacities, cybersecurity, disinformation, strategic communications, and so forth, and specifically to do it in a context, like we've been saying here, where neighboring countries have shared concerns in this online environment and can learn from one another and can pool, the, pool their intelligence and pool their resources. Um, so that's that's one broad spectrum of work that we're, we're engaged in. The second is, and I, I think this is sort of the mirror image of a point that Kevin was making about the need for innovative approaches. Um, we're really concerned with one, that, and two, the fact that we're having to do this innovation in addressing cybersecurity disinformation in kind of a knowledge vacuum. So um, one thing that we've done is pulled together just a big giant catalog of uh, a lot of the efforts that we're aware of around countering disinformation. I'll share that in the chat. Um, and two, we're, you know, we're not an advocacy organization by any stretch, but we really see a lot more need for coordination with the social media platforms, for, um, Andrew's question in the chat, with all of the major technology players from the telecoms on up, it doesn't really matter, either to proactively release more information about what's happening on their platforms so that we're not in a total research gap, in particular with regards to non-American, non-English or French or Spanish speaking communities, um, and in particular with an eye towards intersectional impacts on marginalized communities. There's, there's a near total lack of information available. It's guesswork. So we, we need to take high risk approaches, but the need to take high risk approaches is really unfortunate given the extremity of the problem. We need more data. So we are um, working in partnership with a number of tech companies just to bring more of that to the table. A lot of it's there for the asking and they're very, very happy to come to the table with it. Uh, and then we're also working to uh, work uh, like with these transnational networks to identify shared points of concern to, to bring big asks to the table to companies about what data would be most useful to prioritize in, in releasing. So uh, lots more transparency needed and lots more and novel forms of transnational collaboration are needed. Uh, and those two things come together nicely, I think, hopefully. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, and let's open for, for questions and for comments. Uh, any questions from the room, first of all? I have a question, actually. Please. Hello, my name is Mikhail Romatka. I'm from the Embassy of Iran here in Prague. And I have a question probably mostly for Veronica and Christina because it's about the Czech disinformation scene. I've noticed that uh, many of the protesters who organized protests against COVID restrictions in the February and in this, this period, they now, they now moved 
on the new protests against the Czech government, which often have uh, also pro-Russian sentiment and anti-Ukrainian. So I wanted to ask you if you think there is any, if this could be uh, funded by the Russian organizations or governments, or if you think it's just the own in initiative of the, of, the, mm -hmm. of the people who organize the protests. Uh, if I may start, uh, I mean, this is not the first time we see this, uh, the similar group of people who once again were writing disinformation about Ukraine, then wrote about migration crisis, then wrote about COVID, then suddenly after Vrbjetica became for Russia again, then COVID again, and now after the invasion, they again deal with Ukraine. So it's a little bit of a cycle. Uh, I think that from our monitoring and from the data that we have, for sure, is that it certainly shows some some level of coordination because the messages they spread are similar, their timing is similar. Information about specific funding we do not have, so we cannot say, unfortunately. Yeah, I definitely agree. We don't have any proof that there are some financial links or flows. But uh, based on based on uh, the narrative they spread and the topics they are interested in, there is some kind of correlation and some bit of this. Yeah. yeah. To be completely fair to them, there are, are other motivations they might have to do this, be it yeah. social, personal, financial, from advertisement, as I mentioned, or even ideological. Mm -hmm. Sure, it might come from other reasons. Uh, but yeah, but to be, I, I would also mention that if the Russian government, if the Russian government wanted. To mobilize them it would probably be very cheap yeah just like. because if, <laughs> if you look at it they are not so effective yeah the COVID is kind of a different story but uh, regarding uh, the anti-ukraine protests and so yeah. forth there are a couple of people maybe dozens but that's yeah. it they can yeah they are just uh, that they are may maybe local on social media well, vocal on social media but it's just social media uh, when it comes to you know the reality and they rely or protest there are really a couple of them so. uh, Matt you wanted to come in on this as well yeah and just a very quick point um which is that the availability of good data that is that can reflect transnational corrupt monetary flows is also a key ingredient here that looks unfortunately a lot like the question of good data about disinformation and what's being used to combat it and you know I mentioned our effort on uh, ad transparency a lot of this sort of corruption or corrupt influence is not very far below the surface. So who's buying ads, who's conducting influence operations. It's not just the Kremlin uh, or CCP, it's increasingly kleptocrats and localized. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, I have another question that's come in uh, specifically for Veronica and Christina. I wanna ask Rashtra about this as well. Uh, and Matt did touch upon this, whether the Facebook's con content moderation efforts are sufficient. Um, and let's look at it specifically in the Czech Republic, but not only about Facebook, but you know the media, uh, our media providers as well. Uh, if it's not sufficient, what can be done to make them perform better? I will leave this question completely up to you. Yeah, I will just say regarding the Facebook, which I'm aware of, there is uh, one moderator for uh, the Czech, uh, Czech Facebook, I would call it. And uh, it's just one person for a whole Czech Facebook. So, and uh, the task uh, I'm aware of, it, like it was two years ago when she uh, did the interview on one of the, one of the TV was that she actually reads the, the post and market label it as uh, true or not. Mm -hmm. So it's one person on all the Czech Facebook. So. With being this said, the moderation is not adequate. It's a, uh, I would say that there is no moderation. So the disinformation and the narratives are all uh, simply amplified through the Facebook groups, Facebook mm -hmm. chats, or public profiles, or so forth. And, when it, and if I could, to, Matt, to, to I, augment further. Uh, I would uh, just mention that there were uh, attempts of the government at the beginning of the invasion to I, no, it's not attempt. Actually, the government uh, decided or advised the authority to block several disinformation websites. I think it was eight of them. It was for three months, and it uh, showed us that uh, it was like nice, nice show off that uh, the authority can do something like that. 
but it wasn't effective. So uh, there is no media reg regulation or media content moderation. We have uh, more than four, uh, yeah, 40 uh, disinformation outlets in the Czech Republic, which are really uh, writing and existing. So there is no thing such that. Thank you. Thanks. How do we know it was not effective? I mean, we all talked about collective data, the rare opportunity where you can actually see what's happening in the data is like mm -hmm. when it drops. Yeah, we could, flop. yeah, we actually at the semantic vision, we monitored uh, the number of disinformation articles before uh, the suspension on the website. Yeah, there is a drop like for two days. But the duty uh, and the task was overtaken by different uh, by uh, the outlets which actually were not suspended. So it was just eight of them, uh, mm -hmm. and there are like thirty more, at least. So I would maybe briefly add that yes, it was also Josef Schlerka who yeah. did investigation into the impact of this ban, uh, and for a couple of weeks it took them like a couple of days or weeks to find new domains or new channels like Telegram to go back. So it might may have had some very short term impact, even just for them to sort of get together mm -hmm. again. Uh, but in the long term, it doesn't solve the problem systematically. And it had there were other issues with this decision because first of all, it was not done transparently enough. It wasn't sure clear why these sites and not other sites. It was not clear for how long they have been banned. And that goes back to the fact that we discussed before that there is no framework in the Czech Republic for dealing with this. So they all sort of have this uh, approach like hit and miss. <laughs> we'll try something and let's see. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Raja, you want to come in on this uh, briefly, please? Very briefly. I mean, very similar situation. One certified fact checker for Slovakia on Facebook, uh, where I believe uh, it's probably even the worst situation when it comes to Facebook uh, in Slovakia. And uh, it actually took um, a letter uh, from US congressman to Facebook to finally uh, switch off one of the most problematic uh, politician uh, and then, of course, I mean, I completely agree with Veronique. I mean, we had a very similar situation with the, with the National Security Office basically doing something similar with our top uh, disinformation websites. Uh, now, while I agreed with, with, the, with, the, with the essence of the decision, I completely disagreed with the lack of transparency, the lack of actually legal explanation. I'm really afraid that this could create a precedence whereby a less democratic government could actually try to sort of stifle uh, a, a professional media in the future. So I think, uh, you know, there, I think we have to be uh, very careful. And, uh, and, and uh, yeah, I think we are really uh, in need of more systematic uh, uh, sort of uh, solutions, I mean, to this. And, and obviously, I, I think here we are talking about legal uh, grounds based on which you could really uh, take uh, such disinformation websites down. Thank you, Rastro. Final question, and I'm asking for brief answers. Uh, again, asking all of our panelists, if you could give one piece of advice to the Czech government or the Czech authorities on how to better prepare against Russian government influence, what would that be? data is here. Average threats in general it's a complex problem which targets various parts and levels of our society and state, and we can't solve it with one thing. So I think that the piece of advice would be stop thinking in these like small resorts, think about it more comprehensively, and there is no answer like what is the main one thing that we should do. We should do all of it. I am sorry that it's not so mm -hmm. clear, but we should think about it in a bigger picture. That is a very good answer, I think. Um, Kevin, what was your take on this? 
my quick sentence is don't be afraid of civil society responses, unleash them. Um, I think it's not for many reasons that we don't have to go into the governments and platforms aren't going to be the ones I think in the future to really solve this problem fundamentally it's going to be civil society. And you got to work with them you got to find ways to support them with strategic communication with data, whatever else is out there that seems appropriate um, so unleash civil society. Thank you Kevin uh, last year. Again, I completely agree with what was said, I would just add, you know stop undermining the trust of, of of your own institutions i mean stop this uh cheap populism which basically you know offers uh you know simple solutions to complex problems and 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 again this information i completely agree with veronica is a very complex issue and uh, we are not going to be able to solve it uh with simple solutions and we are not going to be able to solve it with with politicians who basically do not have any trust uh, from from the society thank you astro and matt's short final word yeah i mean i i agree with everything everybody said um i think the this point about a silver bullet is key uh, i think there probably is a silver bullet that kills disinformation but it also kills freedom of expression and democracy at the same time <laughs> Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's not a solution, but I think that we all need to pay attention, Czech government certainly among them, to uh, privacy, to ways to tackle these problems while, while protecting privacy and anonymity online, because those are part and, par uh, part and parcel with democratic pluralism and resilience. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, we've come to the end of our time together. I want to thank all your, the panelists. I want to thank all our audience for participating. Again, I want to thank you, USAID, for supporting this event and America's colleagues for preparing it. We'll take a break uh, during the summer and return to these discussions in the autumn, where we'll focus on a wide range of interesting topics. Hope to see you all then. And until that time, stay safe.